Welcome to part two of Heat Pump Mastery. And today we're going to focus on installation. If you were here for the last webinar, Mr. Greg Davenport instructed us on how to do the best uh, design and sizing of a heat pump system. Today, Matt Ryan, who we'll introduce here in a bit, will tell us uh, how to implement uh, that design that we all came up with. Yeah, this training is made possible thanks to support from Better Built Northwest. It's a NIA-based uh, initiative. Uh, if you have never been to the Better Built Northwest website, I really urge you to do so. There are links to uh, many good energy efficient topics there. Okay, here's a brief agenda for the day. We're going to do introductions and the importance of quality installation. Uh, we're going to talk about best practices for those outdoor and indoor units. One of the themes that you'll probably hear today is you can have the best design in the world, but if it doesn't get implemented right, then your design isn't going to work. We're going to spend time talking about piping and line penetrations, and also this, we're going to recap at the at the end of it. On questions and answers, uh, please enter them in the question and answer part. Uh, we'll do our best to maybe answer some in real time, but we have a half hour reserved at the end for uh, more in-depth questions and answers. Uh, I'm Bruce Van Clark. I, uh, I'm called the senior technical advisor at Earth Advantage. Uh, you know, my expertise is over my 45 years in, in this industry as I've worked directly for utilities. I was an HVAC contractor. I've done quality control. So I think my only claim to fame is I've been uh, on all sides of, of the heat pump equation. And um, my background is I'm old and hopefully I pay attention and I've learned a few things about heat pumps. Okay. Uh, we are lucky to have Matt Ryan today. Uh, one, you've got to admit that's the most darling family picture you've ever seen. So, you know, Matt's a good guy. Uh, Matt is obviously a very experienced HVAC contractor. And one of the things I like most about Matt is that he and others that don't mind um, interfacing with uh, efficiency based programs, uh, he has done much to help those of us involved in delivering energy efficient programs, he's, he's helped educate us. He's helped educate us on how things actually work in the field and contractors' uh, attitudes in general towards efficiency. So I'll let you go on and on about yourself, Matt, if you'd like to, if I've missed anything about your background. Nope, that, uh, that sums it up. I appreciate that introduction there, Bruce. Um, first, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking time out of their day and uh, I know Jill's can be pretty hectic um, and so actually taking some time here to to learn some stuff hopefully and uh, yeah I just appreciate it um, yeah uh, I played around a couple years after high school uh, got uh, figured out I better get on track and do something so it was either become an electrician or do HVAC uh, my dad was already in HVAC so it kind of just made sense and uh yeah just dove headfirst into it and um as we've gone uh, through the years here i've just really found uh interfacing with uh, performance building uh yeah really makes me tick it, it interests me on on all kinds of levels so um yeah keeps me engaged and and learning so hopefully we'll uh we'll get some stuff out of out of today here um, we're going to go over install foundations. Uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, show and talk. Uh, there's a lot of photos um, and kind of going over good practices, uh, things we've done wrong or things that we've learned as to why we do them um, and just kind of touch base on, on a wide range. One, one kind of hurdle we had putting this all together was um, we know we don't just have heat pumps. We've got unitary we've got mini split we've got ducted ductless and so there's a lot of kind of various directions to go here we tried to cover it the best we could um, some of it might seem a little generic that's on purpose because um, uh, every brand is different um, so we didn't get too into the weeds and tried to keep it kind of more uh, general um, yeah uh, why proper installation matters. Uh, it's, you know, the question we came up with is what's best for the future occupant. Um, you know, Bruce dug this picture up, I love it. Uh, 
you know, at first look, it's hilarious, but it would work, right? I mean, that that actually would cool the rumor area that they're going for with this. Uh, anyone could go down to the local big box store, put this thing together, and it would work. But uh, we definitely have uh, better technologies out there and uh, more uh, appropriate ways about going about it. So um, kind of going back to what Greg presented, uh, load calcs, equipment selection. I just wanted to touch on that real quick because uh, everything we talk about today is pointless if we don't have a good design and a good uh, foundation uh, to put put the system together. Um, we could go and put a really fancy high-end brand new system, but if it's undersized or oversized, uh, at the end results, not many people are going to be happy. Um, so it all starts here. If you didn't uh, attend it, I'd recommend or suggest going back and watching it. Um, lots of great info, um, both for contractors and subcontractors. Um, uh, what key information we need to have a good load calc um, that that's really critical um, in this piece and it really sets the rest of the project up from there so um, go back and take a look if, if you missed that one uh, we're going to start with outdoor units uh, kind of go over um, some good uh, good practices do's and don'ts um, and uh, you know we have a handful of items that, you know, you want to think about or consider when we're doing outdoor units. Uh, I threw uh, kind of a submittal page in here. Uh, again, kind of a disclaimer, uh, know the equipment you're working with. Um, even within same brands, different lineups can have different clearance requirements. So uh, it's important to get that manual out, know the manual um, and yeah, it's something we actually kind of struggle with here because occasionally we'll have somebody that wants to use a different product than we normally work with and kind of have to relearn some stuff uh, whenever that comes up. So, um, Matt, where, where where can you usually find this mysterious manual for the unit? Is um, it hard to find? Not usually. <laughs> usually Google will do a really good job for you if it goes missing, which, you know, they do go missing. Uh, Google will work for you. Uh, various brands have websites where you can usually go and find it pretty easily. Uh, the example I have here is Mitsubishi. They've got a website where you can go in and find all of their products and all of the literature for those products. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's out there. Um, uh, for our practices, whenever we open up a product and we've got an install manual, we, we usually keep it uh, with the equipment, um. Kind of create a little rack where everything will stay by the indoor unit. Um, so with the outdoor units, clearances, always look at the manual. We're going to look uh, talk about noise considerations, pads, risers, brackets and stands. Of course, aesthetics. Nobody wants to be out barbecuing next to the uh, AC in the middle of uh, summer. And uh, anchorage uh, techniques here. Uh, with our outdoor unit, um, you know, just kind of the basic stuff here where we're looking to uh, make sure it's level, neat, put it on a solid foundation. Don't just throw it down on some dirt. That'll always come back and haunt us. Um, securing the outdoor unit uh, to the pad. Uh, that's actually a, a requirement now. Um, that was kind of a tough thing to, to teach the crews for a bit there because uh, it's kind of a, a, a newer idea there. Uh, making sure we're keeping clearances um, and yeah, again, just keeping it level, straight, neat, um, kind of the key there. Uh, just some, real quick here, Matt. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. For the attendees, if you do have questions, please put them in Q&A and not chat. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple examples here. Um, the one on the left there, you can see, again, nice level pad, the, the risers under there. That's real critical. We'll look at a couple more here in a minute. Uh, the guys on the right there, again, nice, neat level pads. Um, those ones we had to go back on and put feet on. I, I don't remember why that happened. I think it might have been during some supply issues. But um, 
Uh, the unit on uh, the right photo unit on the left there is actually a sand and heat, uh, heat pump water heater. Um, yeah, what we've learned on those, it's actually nice to keep those up off the ground even more. They um, they like to build up ice uh, in the winter time. Similar to what the photo here in the left is. Uh, again, with outdoor units, um, you know, here's a couple examples of brackets. Um, you can see in the photo on the right with that taller unit, we actually have an uh, uh, angle bracket at the very top there. Um, the one on the left, that actually was during construction and uh, didn't have gutters on quite yet. So also be aware of that drip line um, above you. Um, I know in our metro area, most places are going to have gutters, but some of the outer areas from here, you will run into that. Um, uh, both of these were a little further out from the metro area. So that's why the stands kind of came into play there for snow levels and that. Yeah. Matt, I've seen systems, and again, I kind of live in a more uh, wintry place than, than a lot of you do. Uh, do you think if you do get, you know, if you know you're in a heavy snowfall area, is it worth the expense of maybe building a snow roof over the outdoor unit? Yeah, absolutely. Anything to keep, uh, keep that off of there, keep that unit clear. Um, uh, that snow buildup, drifting, any of that will, will greatly reduce the capacity. And that's when we're going to need it the most, uh, when we get that snow buildup, frost buildup. Um, so anything we can do to keep that off of there, just, uh, if you're going to put a roof on it or any kind of fence or enclosure, just got to make sure you're maintaining those clearances. Thank you. Uh, just threw these in to talk about wall brackets real quick. Uh, I get asked uh, for those quite often and most of the time I'm talking folks out of them. Uh, they're better than they used to be, but they do still transmit a little bit of noise. So, you know, you throw that thing on a bedroom wall, you're going to be going back to move it. Um, these are both commercial settings, so they just wanted them up off the ground and tucked away. Um, and so it just made sense to use the wall brackets in, in these applications. But um, residents, I definitely try my hardest to, to steer clear of that. Um, you'll kind of get that that real low harmonic, like a tri bus driving by <laughs> um, in the background and um, definitely noticeable. So <clears throat> this is... Uh, <laughs> This is actually from my house. Uh, this is my the unit for my mother-in-law's quarters. And uh, we did not put feet in. And this is from a couple years back where we got pretty heavy snow. So you can see what uh, what that does when we don't have the proper proper base underneath it. Uh, get the feet up, get it up out, out of the snow, give it places for it to drain during defrost. Um, and we also mentioned pan heaters on this slide. Um, most newer units come with pan heaters built into them. It's, it used to be an option. Now it's pretty standard. We get into that freezing weather. Um, it, it can build up pretty quickly uh, in that real cold weather. I think east of the Cascades, most of the folks out there already know about this and a lot of them have had, already had to deal with it. So, and, uh, and then also just, in that background, ignore that mess. I had a science experiment going. I, <laughs> I love to play around with heating and test things out, doing a little floor heat project uh, trial there. So um, yeah, we were having fun with that one. We got a quick question from the audience here. Yeah. And you know, you might not have a big enough sample size to know the answer, but with the wall brackets, do you find any less noise transmission on a two by six wall as compared to a two by four wall or? Um, I haven't had any issues that I know of, and I definitely haven't, the couple that maybe have, you know, we were able to resolve with just having kind of a rubber pad behind the bracket against the wall. Um, definitely don't know difference between two by four and two by six. I haven't had any, I haven't noticed anything that would cause that to be a, a factor. Thank you. Uh, jumping into indoor units here, uh, we're going to look at some wall cassettes first, then we'll we'll dive into some ducted uh, air handlers as well. Um, kind of a wide variety to touch on here. Um, 
With the indoor units, uh, wall cassettes specifically, um, you're looking for, with location, we're looking for kind of a good, good area where we've got good throw. We're not throwing this thing into a hallway where it's just gonna throw two, three feet and bounce off the other side of the hallway. Um, we're trying to find an open area to, to really get the, a good mix of air. Uh, there are filters on these that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner will, will need to deal with. So, you know, probably not 12 feet up on a wall is not ideal. Um, also, you know, down low, too low where it's blowing right on somebody's face. That wouldn't uh, lead to a happy customer either. Uh, considering where our refrigerant piping and where our condensate lines are going to run, also a big factor. Um, you know, I lost track of how many times I've been asked to put a head somewhere where it's just like, well, we have to run lines to that head. You know, that location is just not feasible. Um, uh, there's no Bluetooth wall cassettes yet. So, uh, Another uh, important factor with location is these guys will get dirty over time. Um, you know, environment plays a big factor into it. Um, but uh, uh, this photo here is a great example of what's involved with actually fully taking one of these cassettes apart and spraying it clean. And uh, it's a lot of work. And if you got that tucked into a really tight place, it's really hard to uh, maintain and service them for sure. Matt, do you have a feel for like, and I, I realize that indoor air environment and homes differ from from one house to another house, but how often do you think this sort of deep clean needs to be done? Uh, actually, that's a great question, Bruce. Uh, we actually had done wall cassettes in quite a few commercial settings, uh, light commercial, but commercial nonetheless. Uh, we started talking people out of wall cassettes uh, unless they wanted to have uh, annual maintenance agreement. Um, those, especially the fan blade, yeah. is on the supply side so you get cold moist air on that fan blade it's going to start collecting dust debris and growth uh over time so with commercial we were finding we'd have to go in there every three to six months and do a deep clean uh in a residential setting uh if if you know it's a cleaner home and they're keeping up on that filter once a month and getting that cleaned off um, you know, you might have to do that deep clean once a year, um, typically. Um, yeah, so it, it those need to be gotten to more often than than people know. And so that's that was a great question and, and thing to point out there. Um, and as you can see, it's it's involved. It's it's about an hour long process per cassette to, to get in there and do that. Uh, again, uh, this is condensate pumps. Uh, we always try to, uh, we try to do as a company, try to keep, uh, keep it gravity wherever possible. Uh, every once in a great while, you know, you have to go to that condensate pump. Definitely not ideal for, uh, bedrooms. Uh, it's, it's not a, um, constant noise it's sporadic and you know that thing cycles on in the middle of the night that it, it, it'll wake you up it's uh they're not terrible but but it's definitely that noise and the, a silent night it'll it'll stick out to you there it also is a great point uh for algae other growth um got to maintain and clean those on on a regular basis as well so try to avoid them sometimes you have to use them uh, some of the newer ones are better than they used to be, um, but that's just an example there of, uh, of needing a pump. Again, gravity, water still runs downhill after all these years. Um, so, you know, kind of an interesting example we found there, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, you know, making sure it's ran uh, downhill still uh, uh, away from the building, uh, away from being able to cycle back into a crawl space or a vent. Um, walkways, it's, it's not 
you know, middle of summer and you get this big old wet spot on your main entry to the house, it's not ideal. Um, it's not going to freeze. You're only going to have condensate in the summer times, but uh, still just kind of an aesthetic uh, thing there. Uh, also, kind of touch on this a little later, but condensate lines, you know, for going out through a foundation vent or, you know, through siding, you know, make sure it's sealed proper. Um, things like to, to crawl through holes anywhere you can. And again, try to avoid the condensate pump unless we really absolutely have to. Uh, Matt, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, so, somebody is inquiring about, gee, you, you know, you're, you're putting that into the drain spout. Are, are you worried about the condensate freezing at all in that, con in, nope. in that drain? Nope. nope. How come? With, with heat pumps, we're only going to have condensate uh, in the summertime. Uh, on, on the indoor heads, we're only going to have condensate in the summertime. Uh, wintertime, that condensate is going to be at the outdoor unit. Uh, every time that thing cycles into defrost, um, you're going to get water, which then is going to refreeze, and that's that's why we're con that's why we elevate the outdoor unit. Uh, wintertime, it's going to want to try to build up frost and ice, and and so that's where that ends up. Which, as we're talking, I'm going to make a note of that. That might be a good thing to touch on while we're talking outdoor units. Uh, going to jump into ducted systems. Uh, this is uh, this was a in uh, in progress uh, photo here. It's actually my brother-in-law's house uh, putting in a new uh, uh, ducted heat pump for him. Uh, we got our this application. We took out a gas furnace, put in a new air handler. You can see the B vent there uh, capped off. It actually. Uh, T came out later on in the process. Um, and then uh, just with ducted systems, uh, you know, depending on if we're doing kind of a retrofit where we're going to use existing ductwork or if we're going, you know, fully new duct uh, job, you know, there's definitely a lot of considerations. And then a lot of the newer equipment, especially when we're working with uh, variable speed stuff, there's a lot of, uh, airflow adjustments. I don't dig very deep into this because every brand is very different. Um, so again, that's kind of a consult your manual uh, as to how to set it up. And we're also using our load calc and design uh, to tell us what to set it to. So um, kind of taking both pieces, um, which all ties together in commissioning, which is uh, part three of this series. Uh, here's another photo of a retrofit, um, you know, just planning on the retro will really help and kind of cleaning up the job uh, at the end there. Um, got our line set routing all kind of planned out, tight and neat together, condensates, uh, clean wiring, can't see it because it's all tucked away on the left side there. Um, you know, in retrofit, if the existing system's working, uh, you could run the old system to get some static pressures and kind of get an idea as to what that ductwork's capable of. And it really helps with the planning phase. Um, not all of, can't do that all the time. A lot of times in retrofit, it's a, a dead unit you're replacing. So in that instance, you're going off of duct sizing and, and you know factoring and all of that in, in your replacement there. Uh, once you're all done, uh, know the flow, um, like to go back and verify airflow. Uh, this was a new install. So we, and it, with all new ductwork, so we were really able to control, uh, a lot of factors. Uh, so on this particular one, we went back and, um, you know, verified airflow across the air handler actually did a room by room on this project. Uh, if you look really closely at this picture, yes, we are measuring two different points on the return air duct just because we wanted to see what effect uh, that 90 and short section of flex had. Um, and it was pretty interesting. That actually, it actually jumped a fair amount um, just from that short distance there. So uh, that was kind of a fun in the field experiment. Going to jump into piping essentials and line set penetrations. Uh, you know, again, good planning. 
plan their plan the routing of the pipe. Uh, good plan will help minimize piping length. Um, shorter the better. Uh, good piping practices, keeping it clean, uh, clean and dry. Dry has been a challenge this last week for sure. Uh, using the right tools. Um, you know, when first got into mini splits, they're, you know, had to make sure you had the right flaring tool, uh, a torque wrench, which a lot of us weren't really that familiar with uh, at that point. And now they've come out with a lot of a lot newer fun toys, uh, a lot more accurate, making our jobs easier. Then you know, leak making sure we're doing a leak test and a proper evacuation and startup. Um, yep, making sure piping is kept dry, dry and clean. Um, you know, taping the ends, uh, making sure it's just sealed off and not just left wide open. This picture here I took uh, as an example of, uh, you know, we ran the line set at rough end, so we kind of boxed out a little area. So we had uh, some room to maneuver and work uh, at finish when that cassette actually got set. Um, yeah, just good, good practices. Uh, here's a couple photos of some newer tools and toys. Um, that that photo on the right there is a uh, it's it's new to us as well. We just got a few of those. Um, it's actually a battery powered flaring tool, and uh, I don't know how many are actually doing the work, um, but uh, that tool is amazing. Uh, it does the flare perfect every time, as long as you prep the pipe right, and it's really. Uh, you know, once we kind of switched over to these tools, got everybody trained and using them, uh, our system leaks went to pretty much zero. Um, and torque wrench, really important. Um, you can over tighten a flare and cause just as many problems as uh, not tight enough. And so that's that's been something we've really hammered in here is uh, making sure we're torquing proper. Um, piping essentials when we're doing flares, um, we're never reusing the pre-made flare on pipe. We're always making our own. Uh, once you've tightened that flare down, it's it's a one-shot deal. So if it has to get disconnected for any reason, we are um, uh, remaking that flare. Um, re uh, refrigerant oil to the end of the flare. Um, we don't do that. We actually use a product called Nylog. Um, we just went also to a recent training class and they actually were back to not using anything. So that's kind of changed over the years. I'd say consult your manufacturer. if They have um, brand specific training um, or tech support, check with them. Um, it, it's changed so much. Um, we personally we use that nylog just as a as a secondary uh, uh, helper there uh, and then using uh, the supplied uh, flare nuts um, there are not as much but there's still some stuff out there for uh, oil pipe oil furnaces uh, that flare is different than what we use for 410a um, and so it's uh, not as much as you know, handful of years ago, uh, but that was a, a thing to really watch out for. Still is, just not as much. Um, systems where we're brazing, not flaring. Make sure you are purging nitrogen while you do your brazing. Uh, protect the TXV, the valves. Um, those are heat sensitive. You can't overheat them and damage them. If we're not purging nitrogen, it's just a matter of time before you'll be back replacing the TXV. Um, you know, that's one that we have to really hammer home with the install crews because they're not always necessarily aware of that from our service team where maybe a year or two down the road, um, not purging caused some buildup and then that buildup eventually clogs that TXV or takes it out. Uh, a good evacuation, um, a triple evac, again, consult the manual. Um, there's varying levels as to how deep of a vacuum they want you to pull and for how long. Um, new vacuum pump oil each time. 
uh, that's just, uh, well, as, as the slide here, it's good, good cheap insurance. Uh, quarter oil is 23 bucks and it, it'll insure a good dry vac each time you do that. Matt, why is it important to do that evacuation? Um, it's pulling all of the non-condensables out of the lines. So everything's been connected, everything's been pressure tested. You then start vacuuming. You're pulling all of the non-condensables, all of the moisture, everything's out of those lines. The only thing that's gonna be in those lines when you're all done is refrigerant. Um, if any moisture is in there, that can damage, that, that mixes with the compressor oil, causes acid, can damage the system long-term. If you have non-condensables in there, uh, the refrigerant, as it boils and condenses, um, when that when those non-condensables mix in there, you lose performance and also over time can cause damage to the system. Thank you. Uh, an example of um, some other tools here, set of gauges. I love I love the newer digital gauges. Uh, it gives you all of your pressures. You know, with both uh, temp clamps on, uh, you get all of the critical, most of the critical information that you need all here in one screenshot. Um, so uh, this is more of a unitary system, not going to be able to have uh, as much of this information on a, uh, on a mini split system. Then the photo on the right is just an example of a, um, uh, what it would look like if you have someone there vacuuming the system down. Um, we've, we've changed practices. This is actually a dated photo. Um, we do our vacuums a little different now, um, but that, that's probably a subject for a, a different class. <laughs> so um, yeah. I uh, got some examples of uh, some line sets, uh, protection and, and sealing. Um, the one on the left there, you can see some exposed copper. Uh, that's, that's kind of uh, a big no-no. Um, you lose a lot of efficiency through that exposed copper. Uh, that's what I try to hammer home here is uh, you should see no copper or brass. Uh, it should be uh, indoor to outdoor, completely uh, insulated and sealed up. Summertime, they'll sweat a lot. You'll get a lot of condensate on those lines. And in the wintertime, you're just losing performance. Um, center photo there, you can see a pretty good example of that line set uh, well wrapped and protected. It's a great job at keeping the UV off of it. And then another example there on the right of just a, a good clean. It's insulated all the way to the connection point there. Also on that center picture, you can see where they come out of that line hide. Um, they did a good job sealing that end off there, uh, making sure nothing's gonna go in or out of there. Um, yeah, a little bit more here on just the insulation and protection, uh, cover all of that copper and brass components. Um, it's actually becoming code now. Um, that bottom photo, you can see the UVs really chewed up that, that insulation that comes with the line sets. Um, kind of learned that lesson the hard way on a couple commercial settings. Um, there's a lot of good products out there uh, to wrap those lines. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just making sure we're protecting those, making sure those holes are all sealed up. Um, just good, good building practices there. Um, hey. Hey, hey, Matt, we've got a couple of questions that seem pertinent to what you're talking about yeah. right now. Yep. Do, you, do you have a a favorite sealant to use outdoors when you're trying to, you know, fill the gap between the line hide and the refrigerant piping and electrical cable? Yeah, I, um, you know, here it says spray foam. Spray foam doesn't do great uh, on the exterior. I, I tend to look for like a, a Vulcan or a um, polyurethane sealant, um, something like that. You know, call, relying on caulking, it is something that has to be maintained and watched. It's not a forever uh, deal, but uh, tend to lean that direction. Um, larger, like coming through a foundation vent, you know, carrying some extra screen with you to uh, seal up any uh, oversized holes. Um, and if they're... Uh, what's the word I'm, like a steel wool product also uh, i've used that before mm. as well uh to help uh, uh 
there's rodent issues. Um, <laughs> we've all been in that house where we know there's rodent issues, some steel wool behind some caulking or weatherproofing uh, agent. When that's all kind of retrofit, I guess when we're talking new construction, there's a lot of uh, good products out there. Airx is probably one of my favorite ones. They've got a lot of different uh, products uh, for line set penetrations. Uh, they'll actually have like rubber boots that you can kind of tighten down. Um, it's another note to make for future presentations uh, to have something in there for that. Uh, yeah. I got, here's another really good question. <laughs> okay. And I like this because I was confused about this for a while. Uh, should both refrigerant lines be insulated? I see a lot of only one pipe covered instead of both for the outdoor lines. Good this is a question. good question, Matthew. Yeah. So uh, I use the word unitary. Uh, that's kind of what I, conventional heat pump. Uh, with those systems, you have a metering device inside and you have a metering device outside. Um, when the metering device is on the inside, that's where you'll see the one line insulated and the other line not insulated. When we switch over to mini splits, like uh, the photo here, um, those metering devices are only in the outdoor unit. There's no metering device at the indoor unit. In that instance, you're gonna have both lines insulated. Um, you are concerned about heat loss, heat gain on those on both of the lines when you're talking mini splits, whereas a conventional system, um, there's only the one line where you're concerned about um, heat loss. There are rare occasions where when you have a really long line application, we're talking close to 100 feet of line set, you might have to look at having that other line insulated, but that's a pretty rare, I, I can count on one hand where I ran into that after, in 20 years doing it. So, yeah. This one, I owe Bruce credit on this one. I'm not the best when it comes to soft skills, but uh, when you're all said and done, uh, going over things with the homeowner. Um, you know, if it's if we're trying to accomplish heating and cooling throughout the house with, with cassettes, making sure interior doors are open. Um, I guess even in retrofit, usually new, new ductwork, we usually have, um, better setups, better systems for the interior door debate, but uh, good practice to leave them open when possible. Making sure they know that they have filters that need to be cleaned, showing them where and how to clean those filters. Uh, this is a big one here. Um, don't make big changes in set points. Um, with all of the new variable speed technologies, um, we're having to make sure to educate uh, big swings are going to drive that electric bill up. There's going to be comfort issues. Um, takes a lot less energy with these systems to maintain versus um, trying to recover, you know, eight to 10 degrees in the morning uh, after they've set it way back. Um, and yeah, if we're not explaining all of these benefits, uh, you know, explaining how the benefits work to the homeowner and how to use the system, you know, we put a really high-end system into a house and that they get no benefit from it if they're, you know, still trying to treat it like a uh, older gas oil furnace type of system. Matt, you know, in terms of things the homeowners can do for, for maintenance, we've talked about cleaning the filters on the inside. Is there anything they should pay attention to on the outdoor unit? Outdoor would just be watching the uh, coil on the outdoor unit. Um, that's usually something that would be maintained by HVAC contractor. Um, some homeowners feel savvy enough to do it. Um, and some people with, you know, depending on location, if you've got a lot of cottonwood around your area, that'll build up on those condensers really fast or the outdoor units really fast. And, um, you know, some, some homeowners are capable of, of dealing with that. Um, others will have maintenance agreements and we'll, we'll take care of that, but not a whole lot. It's, it's with the mini splits, it's really making sure coils are clean. That's the big one. We, we've got a comment from Nicholas about, you know, things to educate the customer about. One is the defrost cycle. Mm. You, know, you, you get that call, how come my outdoor unit's on fire or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Big plume of smoke on my outdoor unit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, 
and uh, uh, the defrost cycle also with, with that homeowner education. Yeah, that's that's critical. Uh, the the big one for us recently has been the the changes in set point. We've we've actually um, spent some time training the office uh, for when we get those phone calls of you know how what's your thermostat set to how are you using it and and able to a lot of times have a brief conversation and able to kind of redirect that without having to turn it into a big big ordeal you know i know a lot of things i learned about heat pumps 40 years ago has, has changed or they were just myths but i think one of the best pieces of advice i got and it still holds true today is set it and forget it with the thermostat yep. for heat pumps yep still works today i i uh we, we have a variable speed system on our place and I have, I like it cooler at night. So we, we do drop maybe a degree or two in the bedrooms, but, um, other than that, I mean, we're not touching that thermostat. Um, it's, it's once it's set, just let it do its thing and, and, uh, make sure that filter gets changed. Kind of a recap there, uh, location, 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 um, you know, Aesthetics are a big deal now, uh, especially when we're trying to throw a piece of equipment in someone's backyard where they like to hang out. Uh, noise concerns. Um, our, our system at our house is actually right outside our primary bathroom window. And, you know, what, two weeks ago when we had that cold spell, I, you know, you know, it's running. Um, don't have to worry about that. Uh, but we know it's running in the middle of the night because we're hearing it. So, you know, making sure, uh, you know, we're not too close to bedrooms with the units um, and then clearances, making sure everything's clear that the system can get good transfer uh, of air. Good clean piping practices, um, you know, making sure it's dry, making sure it's clean. Don't don't drag it through the mud. Don't point it wide open up into the air and let it be a rain catcher, um, you know, using the right tools, going through the proper uh, startup. Uh, commissioning, which we'll dive a lot deeper into in the next one, um, and then customer education and making sure we're relaying um, the best way for the the end user to use the this new high end system we put in. Uh, one really pertinent question right now from the crowd here is, you know, does that triple evacuation procedure eliminate the need for a vacuum decay test? Do you find no? Nope, still need to do a vacuum decay test. Um, what do manufacturers sort of tell you how long that decay test should, should go for? Uh, <laughs> depends on which one you're uh, reading. Uh, I've seen them, uh, I've seen them as short as 15 minutes. I, I want to say the other brand is 30 minutes and then I've seen them up to an hour. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it really does vary by manufacturer and even the micron level will vary by manufacturer. Um, I know for us, we like to see it under that five. A lot of our new systems will, will, will stay under 200, um, but we like to see it stay under that 500 number for, for about 30 minutes there. Uh, underneath customer education, uh, the Honorable Dan Wildenhouse has a question I don't know the answer to, and is, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to have summers here in the Northwest, unlike Duluth, Minnesota. Um, is there a way to sort of like, you know, if you're installing this in, in summer, is there a way to trick or force the system into the defrost cycle in summer just so you can sort of educate the homeowner this is what's going to happen? Um. So our two main brands, um, one of them is a yes, and the other one is a no. Um, and that's a great question. I'd actually have to dig in to see if that's even possible to do with the Mitsubishi. Um, I know our other main brand that we use, uh, American Standard, you can force those systems into defrost. Uh, the one unfortunate part is you, you know, you need that colder day to really get that full effect of the the, mm -hmm. the plume coming off the system. Um, 
but as far as like noises and what happens, yes, some brands you will be able to force defrost, uh, some you can't. 